in Bible class. I'd like to thank the radio station for this a lot of times. But most importantly, we've come together this morning to praise and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, can you leave some word of prayer, please? Y'all yeah. join me for prayer this morning. Lord, we come again one more Sunday on this side of heaven. We come to fellowship and sing songs, Lord. I'm thanking you for the, the beautiful day that we have here. I know some are feeling, Granny says it's too cold, but I think it's just about right. So, uh, Lord, I know these times, if you don't like the weather here in Texas, just give it 15 minutes and it'll probably change on us. But, Lord, we just thank you for your uh, invasion in our souls, Lord, that we can walk in your light, Lord. I know repentance and faith, Lord, uh, and God's children, uh, they exactly answer each other. Uh, by repentance, says that we still feel the sin remains in our hearts and it clings to our words and, and our deeds. But by faith, the power of Jesus Christ comes to us and it purifies our heart and cleanses our hands. And repentance says that we can do nothing without Jesus Christ. But by faith, in all things and everything, in the power of Jesus Christ, we can do. So we come here this morning, Lord, walking in your righteousness, Father that we may walk up upright and look towards you in all that we do. Lord, we ask your blessing. Uh, we ask your anointing upon those that are speaking your word this day, Lord. Today, Lord. We just ask you lift them up, uh, prop them up, Lord, and give them the words uh, as we come here to you today. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we lift this time up to you. In your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Todd. You know, uh, before the men's Bible class meets again, we're going to celebrate the holiday of Thanksgiving. Be lots of uh, food, fellowship, friends, family, joining together, uh, big time. The Word tells us to enter the courts of heaven with thanksgiving and praise. And uh, here in a minute, Brother Josh and Brother Jerry going to come up and, and share with us a song. But as they do, uh, uh, as we open up our hearts in, in reminder of the, of the thanks and the gratitude that we're supposed to enter the courts with, having an understanding of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, and having an understanding that life itself uh, eternally is, is on the, the blood and body of Christ. And our rescue uh, from from this earth and the, the things, the destiny that through the fall of man uh, that we were destined to die. And yet, through Jesus Christ, we shall live. Amen. So, Lord, we, we give thanks this morning. And we enter your courts, Lord God, this morning with thanks. And asking Jerry and Josh to come up and lead us in, in praise to your name. <laughs> You're making me think of that song that says those exact words. <laughs> but we're going to get more intimate. <clears throat> Take me past the outer court.
Nelfus uh, speak to us this morning through the Word of God, and uh, we want to lift her up as she uh, brings the Word this morning. I want to lift up all, all of you out there uh, and thankful for all of you that are gathered and those that are listening for your hunger and zeal for the things of the Lord. And we pray that the Lord will honor Himself here this morning uh, through His body. And that each one be blessed to hear from heaven the words the Lord would have you to hear this morning. As we enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. Catherine. Morning. Morning. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we do enter through your gates this morning with praise and thanksgiving, Lord and also with awe and wonder of your glory. And Father, we just ask this morning that uh, our hearts, Lord, be right, that they be right with you, Lord, and that we would turn our eyes upon you, Lord, this day, today, Father. We just thank you and praise you, and we ask this in your precious Son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. I worked up. Uh, well, I didn't work it, but I helped on a walk, uh, an Emmaus walk, a, <clears throat> a couple of months ago in Kerrville. And uh, the outside team was having communion. And uh, before we started communion, the Lord kept telling me to go to this scripture. And so uh, I, I didn't have anything to do with the, the, the running or the organization of the walk. And our, our communion that we had set up wasn't... You know, it wasn't anything specifically planned. We were just letting the Holy Spirit move. And so I, I felt the unction to read this scripture. And so um, the uh, pastor that was, was running it said, Catherine has a scripture, come up here and read it. And this is the scripture. I'm, I'm still uh, um, in awe of where the Lord, you can read a scripture or a story, you know, two days ago, and then you read it again and it can you know, there's more. And is that not what we ask the Lord? Lord, we want more. We want more. We want more of you. And he's always revealing himself to us. So we're going to go to Matthew 26. We're going to start at 6. It's the, uh, the anointing at Bethany. It says, And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Well, guess what? We're still preaching it today, are we not? That's awesome, yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, this scripture takes place after the plot of Jesus to be killed, and it's before the crucifixion. So it's in between those two periods. And um, it's interesting to me that it says that, that Jesus is going to Simon the leper's house for supper. Now, back in the day, leopards were considered unclean, yes? They lived outside the city gates. They didn't live in, in the city where everybody was. They always lived outside the city gates. And if they wanted to walk in the city, they had to cover themselves, and usually they would speak out, unclean, unclean. Or people would point to them and say, they're unclean, they're unclean. And isn't it just like Jesus to be going to a leper's house, not only to be in, their, in his presence, Simon the leper's presence, but actually eating at the table with him? I mean, is that not like Jesus? Yes, it is. Um, the scripture doesn't say whether Simon the leper was healed. It doesn't say that. It just says that he went to Simon the leper's house. Now, he could have been healed. He may have not been healed, but it doesn't say. But you didn't hang out with lepers, much less have supper with them. 
So if Jesus is willing to dine with lepers, he's willing to dine with us in all of our circumstances. Um, I, when I read this, I was thinking of all of our circumstances. Yes, I can call it circumstantial leprosies that we carry around, right? Our circumstances uh, don't make us who we are. Um, you know, just like Simon's leprosy doesn't make him who he is, our circumstances do not identify who we are. But we allow our circumstances to overtake us when we don't keep our eyes on Jesus. And so how are we handling our circumstances? How are we praying? Are we praying from a place of uh, hope deferred? Oh, I, I'm going to pray, I hope this happens. Or so-and-so is sick, I'm, I'm praying that I wish the Lord is going to heal them. You guys, we, we already have a victory. The victory's already won. It's already happened, right? So why, why is it many times when I get together, I still hear people praying from a place of, um, it, it's almost like we have trouble with our unbelief. We're, we're praying from a place of unbelief instead of praying from a place of victory. And, and I, don't know if it's, I don't know if it's from uh, bad teaching that we've had passed down and, you know, along the lines that, that, okay, if you pray for someone to be healed and they don't heal, and so, uh, you know, God didn't grant that, so there, there you go. Or is, it a or, are we, or, or is it just from bad teaching that's been passed down from us? But guess what? Our God is a God of evidence. There is evidence. It's all through the Bible. Uh, we, we should be praying from a place of, of, of evidence, yes? God gives us the evidence. We, we've had it in our lives. There's over 3,000 promises in the Bible. I'm going to give you just, I mean, I could just go on and on about this. Uh, we have not because we ask not, right? If you're not going to ask, how is it going to be granted? Where two or more come together, gather together, and ask in the name of Jesus, it shall be so. Uh, this too shall come to pass. My word does not return to me void, but it goes to the nations. Yes, I have good plans for you, says the Lord, to prosper, right? Uh, how about one of my favorites? Seek ye the kingdom first, and everything else will be given to you. You know, I mean, we could go on and on and on about his promises. That, that's the evidence. Um, think about a past circumstance that you've had, a huge one. And, and you've prayed about it, and you thought, oh, you know, Lord, Lord. And then the Lord did it for you. Then all of a sudden you were in a place of joy and victory, were you not, when he took care of that circumstance? So why are we, why are we, why are we not praying in a place of joy and victory already? That right there is your evidence. That's your evidence to say, okay, he, he did it. Right? He hung on the cross for you. He did it. That's the place that we need to pray from. Not, not uh, hope deferred. Not, I hope it's going to happen. We, we don't realize the authority that we carry in the Lord. Right? We want to pray from uh, a place of victory. Already in a place of joy. Knowing that it's done. No matter what we see around us. You know, oh, my son's addicted to drugs. He's not going to get off drugs. Yes, he is. Because the words that you've spoken out do not return to him void. They go out, it's going to come to pass. You know, I always like, uh, uh, my brothers and my sisters, we've been thinking, talking about this, that it says in the word that our life was laid out before the foundations of the world was made, right? So that means our life is already laid out. All we're doing is walking into God's timing. We're catching up to his time, right? So, and he has good plans for us because he hung on the cross. So we are not identified by our circumstances, as Simon the leper is not. Okay, if Jesus can come into a home and dine with a leper, he can come into a home and take care of our circumstances. The evidence is there. Pray from a place that he's already done it. Okay, then you have the woman. Uh, Luke and John, I believe, say it's Mary Magdalene, the adulterer, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Well... Her sins have already been forgiven, and she just wants to live for Jesus. Um, in this gospel, it says that she pours the uh, expensive oil over his head as he sat at the table. And the great thing about Mary, or this woman, is that she didn't care about anyone or what they were saying. All, 
she did was have her eyes on Jesus. She just cared about the Lord. I love it that the scripture says, um, it says, when Jesus was aware of it. So obviously, the relationship that she had with Jesus, Jesus was also having his eyes and mind on her and what she was doing. Because the scripture says, uh, it, it says, uh, but when Jesus was aware of it, that is when he said, why do you trouble this woman? So I love that because it shows the connection between the woman and Jesus. He was letting her and joining in her and receiving what she was giving to him. I think that's beautiful. Um, that's a gift. That what she was doing is a gift. Uh, he was receiving her gift. Um, and that is a, a sign of worship, what she was doing, was it not? She, she was pouring that oil over him to show her love and, and that it was, it was worship. She was worshiping the Lord. And she didn't care about anybody else. Now, did Mary realize that, that she was actually preparing him for his burial? I don't think so. I think she was doing it. I mean, this is my perception. I think she was doing it just because she loved Jesus, because he's forgiven her for, for her sins. She had dedicated her life that, that all she cared about was him. And so it was just her gift of love. I don't really think, maybe she had a, an intuition about what was coming, but I don't really think she had the understanding of what Jesus was fixing to go through. So um, anyway, it just, it just shows you how much she, she loved him and wanted to love on him. Okay, and then there we have the disciples. In other Gospels, it says that they're religious leaders, Pharisees, and in John, it actually points the finger at Judas Iscariot and says that he's the one that said, you know, why are you wasting this? But I don't believe, if it was Judas, I don't believe he was worried about the poor. I believe he was worried about the money because he's the treasurer and we all know what he did, you know, with Jesus. So it would, it would make sense if it was. He, but here in Matthew, it says the disciples saw it was a waste. They could not see past the, the, the cost of the oil. They thought that she was being foolish. And to me, that sounds familiar. Because we can't see our past. We can't see past our ways and our routines in the natural. Right? We have a routine at home. We have a routine at church. We have a routine at work. And we get into this routine where we think that the Lord can't come in and mess up our lives at work. I've been messed up at work a lot of times. Right, Jake? I know he's been messed up at school. You know, I mean, we get so regimented. And, and just like the disciples were all, why are you using that? That's a, that's a cause. That's, that's costly oil. It's a waste for the poor. That was their routine of what they normally did, right? We're the same thing in church. Follow the bulletin. Communion should always be done the same way. Don't get out of the routine. you got to look a certain way when you go to church, right? Jesus wasn't about that. He can mess that up so much and, and put us off our routines and uh, get us out of our boxes. The, the, the disciples were looking at the purpose of what the oil always had been used for instead of really seeing what the woman was doing. And that's, that's what we have a tendency to do. As soon as our eyes get off of Jesus, what do we start doing? We start getting in the routine. And what that does is we get stuck in a box. We get stuck in a box, and then we start putting God in a box. And so he died for us. We can't put him in a box. All things are possible with God, and the, the victory has already been given to us. So what character do you relate to the most? Do you relate to Simon the leper, seeing your circumstances instead of uh, believing Jesus already took care of them? How about the disciples complaining about things and getting bothered because things aren't done the way you feel they should be done? Refusing to get out of your box and the box that you've put God in? Or the woman Mary? who cares nothing for the world, but she has the forgiveness and freedom from her sin and now just wants to have a relationship with Jesus. Do you know who your Jesus is? God bless you. Shalom. <coughs>
Thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> I was talking with Daryl earlier. I guess this may relate to me a little bit when she was asking, do we know who our Jesus is or my priorities? It seems like every time I turn around, I've heard that. Keep hearing the story of the rich young guy who came to Jesus and says, what do I need to do to get into heaven? And Jesus talked to him and said, first he asked him, he said, good man, what do I need to do? And he said, well, why do you call me good? And they asked, what do I need to do to get into heaven? And these are my words. He said, basically, you need to give up all your possessions. Give up everything you have. And it kind of bummed the guy out because he had a ton. He had a ton of stuff. And I was talking to Daryl this morning, and I was just saying, looking around my house, and I said, what do I have that I really actually need? That if something didn't happen to my household, what would bum me out? And that's what part of what I ask you today as we sit there and we ask, we, we, we listen to what Catherine talked about, and we, we really try to focus on who our Jesus is and where our priorities are. What do you have that you really can't give up, that you can't lay it all on the line for Jesus Christ? We're coming into the holiday season where I've mentioned before there are people out there that are not going to be eating as much as we are Thanksgiving or Christmas. They're not going to have a lot of toys where you look underneath the tree and you may see for kids 10, 12 boxes, 13, 14, 15 boxes of presents. There may be literally people out there that just have maybe a hand me on gift that they rewrap that they can give to somebody. It's that time of the year, folks, where I, I pray that you really start looking into your hearts and see what our, our true God is. See if we can't give a little bit of more of ourselves this year instead of waiting on somebody to give back to us. Because I promise you there's still stuff in my closet I can give back to. There's still stuff in my, my house that I don't need that I can give to somebody else that I've been prioritizing for years of all the stuff that I think I really have to have that they really don't have any value to me. The only true value to a man or to me right now is Jesus Christ. He gave it all. He laid upon a tree so that I believe in Him, I can have eternal life. And that's what it's all about. That's a true gift. And it's through God's grace that we have this gift. It's so through no works of our own so that we can have this thing. There's absolutely nothing we can do to attain this except believe in Jesus Christ and ask Him in our hearts to be our Lord and Savior. It's just that simple. It's truly just that simple. As we get closer to the holiday season, we're there at Thanksgiving here this week. <clears throat> Think about that. Think about what you can give back. Knock on somebody's door and tell them about Jesus Christ and ask them what they need today and see what they can, you can do for them. Jake, can you close us in prayer, please? Father, please, Jordan. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for just blessing us and for giving us all a great day today. And I just pray that you help us to worship you today and to give you glory and thanks and praise no matter our circumstances. And may we always have the joy of your Holy Spirit even in the hard times, Lord God. And just please forgive us where we go wrong and help us to have a truly thankful Thanksgiving. You know my prayer. Amen. Um, one announcement, I guess, um, in, in light of what's going on, there's a, there's a Bible study that's going to uh, be open to the community. Anybody wants to, uh, to be a part of it, uh, it's going to start on January the 9th. Uh, the author of the book that Bi the Bible study is based on, uh, not counting the Bible, but uh, the, the book's written by John Bevere. It's called The Heart of Blaze. And uh, the, the Bible study will begin on January the 9th, uh, 6 o'clock in the evening. Uh, it'll be about a 12-week study. Um, and so I encourage you, if you're interested, to get a hold of me or Joe or somebody, and, and uh, we'll get you hooked up with the uh, books and such. Uh, with that being said, uh, bless all of you. Have a happy Thanksgiving. And that's been the Bible class for today. Amen.